thank you so much, everybody, for being here tonight, especially on our, or this afternoon, especially on such a beautiful day. And um, and I want to start off uh, by apologizing and by saying that I'm sorry that Andrea, thanks so much for being here. Uh, one of our board members, Andrea Souza. Um, I, I just want to say that I'm sorry that we're here because you know the folks that work at Green Mountain Transit, the folks who volunteer on our board of commissioners, we are all transit believers. We think that transit is a great way to provide value to communities, um, whether it is how folks get to work, whether it's how they access affordable housing, whether it's how they access medical care or counseling, how they um, work to reduce uh, uh, the impact of climate change. You know, public transit uh, helps with all of those areas. And we, you know, came to GMT because uh, we want GMT to provide the most benefit to its community. And the whole notion that um, that we would have to reduce the service to our communities is kind of uh, the antithesis of, of uh, where we want to uh, be. But it's the situation that we find ourselves in. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we got here, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the plan uh, that we're uh, working on right now, which is a plan that I just want to say nobody likes. Um, especially not the folks at GMT. And um, um, and then more importantly, uh, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to start listening because uh, this is our sixth public meeting. And I have to tell you that I have been so impressed with the quality of the input that we've gotten where people have been able to come in and talk about how public transit has a significant impact on their life and that that's going to allow us to tell the story about why transit is important and uh, to make sure that decision makers uh, at both municipal uh, and state levels uh, know the importance of transit when they're making decisions about uh, funding to GMT. And so, so I'm sorry that we're here. I'm thanking you for being here because we're gonna, you're going to help us be part of the solution. Um, and, uh, um, and so... I, strangely enough, I have found these uh, meetings to be helping me with my optimism about the future because uh, because we're we're hearing so many good ideas from our community members and it's been really uh, helpful to me. And so um, I mentioned we have Andrea, who is the vice chair of the uh, board of commissioners, uh, who just joined us. We have Paul, uh, who is the treasurer for the board of commissioners. Um, they're volunteers. One of the things that I want to make sure everybody knows about Green Mountain Transit is that we are a municipality, and so we're uh, established in statute um, so that we're more like the, the town or the city than you live in um, than, uh, uh, than you may think. And uh, what that means is, is that we don't have a profit motive. And so, uh, you know, we heard from some folks who are like, hey, we hate that GMT is trying to make more profit. Uh, we don't make profits. We, uh, we uh, spend the money that we receive to provide a service. We, we try to break even. And nobody, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to make extra money by cutting service. All of our volunteers are board, or all of our board members are volunteers. They're not going to make extra money by cutting service. And so, uh, so there is no profit motive behind this. And so I just like to let folks know about that. Um, I'm, I want to recognize that uh, with us today we have Ryan. Ryan is with the Teamsters. Uh, the Teamsters uh, is the union uh, for our drivers and our mechanics. And uh, a majority of GMT's employees uh, are members of the Teamsters. And I want to recognize uh, their presence here because, uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of anxiety about uh, the potential loss of jobs uh, for our employees. And so, Ryan, thank you for, for being here and, and participating. So, <clears throat> so earlier this year, um, uh, after we came out of the last legislative session, um, we realized that when we looked at forward um, to fiscal year 26 that we were going to have a funding gap because the, uh, our expenses, um, especially since the pandemic uh, has 
has created so many inflationary pressures, our expenses have gone up very steeply while our uh, income has continued to go up, but has gone up you know, less steeply. That has created a gap between uh, our income and expenses. Now, we've been able to operate our full service despite this gap because uh, when the pandemic happened, uh, we received uh, $18 million uh, worth of federal COVID relief funds. And we used those funds to fill that gap so that we could continue to provide uh, full service to our communities. Uh, those funds will be exhausted um, in fiscal year 26, uh, in just a, a little under a year from now. Uh, fiscal year 26 starts uh, uh, in, on July 1st of 2025. Um, and, uh, and so we know that uh, right now there is a gap of about $2 million between the income that we have coming in in fiscal year 26 and our, ex our expected expenditures. Um, and when we talked with the legislature this past session, what we heard from them uh, was that, you know, there's so many competing pressures for funding that they really wanted us uh, to try to live within our budget. And so uh, the only way that we can do that is by, uh, by considering service reductions. So um, in July, our board of commissioners asked uh, the staff at GMT to come up with uh, a plan to save up to $3 million. So the good news is, is that we wanted to have a plan that would be able to give our board some options. So, you know, the plan is, uh, uh, considers more uh, savings than are necessary. And so we know that uh, unless something changes drastically with our projections, we know that we're not gonna have to implement every aspect uh, of this plan. And, uh, um, and so we, we have a $3 million plan uh, that we then provided to the board uh, in August. And by providing it to the board, that then triggered this public uh, meeting process uh, that we're having. This is the sixth uh, public meetings that we've had. We've had great turnout. We've had great insight from folks um, about, uh, about how uh, transit impacts them. And everybody that participates, um, all of their comments uh, get transcribed and will be um, provided to all of the members of our Board of Commissioners, will be provided to all of our municipal partners, and will be provided to the legislature uh, so that people can see, you know, everybody that essentially has um, a, uh, a stake in the decision making will be able to hear what these, uh, what these comments are. So uh, when we put the plan together, um, uh, before we be put this plan, we, we polled our uh, commissioners and our commissioners are appointed by the municipalities. So they represent each of our uh, uh, municipalities. We also went directly to uh, the municipalities, uh, town managers. We asked them uh, questions about their values and what, what items that they um, you, know, you know, would want us to prioritize. And what we heard was that, uh, that there was a real desire to do three things. Uh, number one was that there was a belief that, uh, that we should focus on local service over commuter service. And so, uh, for example, the number two uh, that connects uh, uh, the village of Essex to, to Burlington um, the number of 10 that connects the town of Essex to Williston, that's considered local service. Um, what is considered commuter service would be like the Jeffersonville commuter, the link uh, um, rides that uh, come in from St. Albans and uh, Montpelier. We saw that there was a preference for us to prioritize. Um, oh, thank you so much, Representative Runner, for joining us. Uh, we saw that there was a preference uh, for weekday service over weekend service. Um, and we saw that there was a desire that where transit was moving the most folks, that we would not undermine that service by decreasing the frequency. And, uh, and so the downside, the flip side of that, is that that then means that where transit is not working as well, is not as economically efficient, we're considering 
uh, reducing or eliminating that service. So uh, the plan was laid out in four phases. Um, the good news is, is that the first phase um, has already happened and doesn't impact um, the, the town of Essex. Uh, that was changes that we made to the neighborhood specials uh, that operate within Burlington during the school year. Um, and, uh, and those changes um, happened in August at the beginning of the new school year. Um, and another change that happened is that uh, one of our commuter routes uh, the 116 commuter, uh, which connects Hinesburg uh, to uh, Burlington, is going to be taken over by Tri-Valley Transit, uh, which is an, uh, one of our partner providers. And they had already previously provided half of this, uh, the runs on that uh, route, and they'll now uh, cover the full amount. And so uh, they'll take over that service actually starting Monday. And, uh, and that uh, this is, we're thankful that we're able to save funds while not having to, the, the service is still gonna be there. And so on Monday, even though GMT won't be providing the rides, everybody will get the same you know, service from, from Tri-Valley Transit. The second phase uh, would happen this uh, November or December 2024. Um, most likely it would be December 2nd uh, when these would be implemented. And these focus on the Jeffersonville commuter and uh, Saturday local service. So for the Jeffersonville commuter, we identified that as a potential route to reduce because our average cost per passenger is $63. And that's just, you know, an extremely economically inefficient uh, service. It's the most cost per rider that we have in our, in our whole uh, area. And so that is a potential uh, elimination of that route. And then for Saturday local service, uh, what we are focusing on is uh, primarily evenings and then reducing the frequency in um, uh, more Burlington-based transit uh, along the uh, number seven and the number six. But it would also include the elimination of Saturday service for the number 10. And so that, that is the, the service that um, is going to most impact the town of Essex. It's really the town of Essex's only uh, uh, public transit. <coughs> Look, and, and so that would be just for Saturday, exactly. Um, the third phase would happen in February or March of 2025. This phase would really focus on uh, commuter service, and what we would likely see is reductions uh, in the Montpelier link. Um, and we would, on the other part of our uh, service area, we would see the Milton commuter and the St. Albans link uh, combined into a single run. And so right now they sort of operate parallel uh, with the St. Uh, Albans link coming down 89 and the Milton commuter coming down seven. Uh, what we would do is we would reroute uh, the link so that it would uh, come down seven, go through Milton, um, and that would provide us cost savings while also actually improving the service uh, for uh, folks in Milton because they'll now have the option of going north or south where previously they could only go from Milton uh, into Burlington. The, the last phase um, would be happening in, in June of 2025. And if all of the service reductions uh, happened, uh, that would include the elimination of three local routes, which would be the eight, uh, which connects the old north end of Burlington to the downtown area of Burlington. The number 11, which connects uh, downtown Burlington to the airport and South Burlington communities. And the number 10. And so I want to recognize that you know, and I should have mentioned, town of Essex is my hometown. I, I, I live here and I can't believe that we have a plan that potentially could have all of the service in my hometown eliminated. And so I'm really hoping to hear from you, uh, your thoughts about that tonight. Um, so in addition to the service reductions, um, we're going to be uh, looking at uh, the fare that's um, uh, required for our ADA service. And so because of the Americans with Disabilities Act, 
if anyone lives within three quarters of a mile of uh, one of our fixed routes, uh, local service, um, then, and if they have a disability that prevents them from being able to use that fixed route service, we need to provide them with equivalent uh, other service. And so we contract the service out uh, to SSTA. And right now, the fare for that door-to-door -door service is $3. Um, we are looking to raise that to $4. Um, last year, when we were uh, discussing the return to fares, we had originally proposed a $4 fare uh, for this service. Um, and we got feedback during the public process that going from zero to $4 was too much too fast. And so we agreed to go from zero to $3. And now we're um, proposing to then go to the $4 as originally planned um, and have that effective in January. All right, so here's the good news. I'm done talking at you. Okay. Um, and uh, let's see. And I'm glad that you're here because I forgot to start our recorder. I'm going to get yelled at by, uh, um, by my staff who are like, are you sure you could handle this on your own? And I'm like, oh, of course I can handle this on my own. You could trust me. You oh boy. Okay. But the good news is the recorder is really for your comments, not uh, everybody at GMT is tired of hearing me talk. Um, and so what we're going to do now is that uh, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to bring you the microphone. And as we heard from our friend Logan with CCTV, um, we're just going to need you to talk into the microphone so that uh, the folks uh, that watch this recording uh, will be able to, to hear your voice. And so now I'm going to open it up to you. And we are, oh, and I'm very happy to report that uh, just arriving is one of our friends from VTrans, uh, Jeremy Whiting. And uh, Jeremy, thank you for being here. Thank you. So here we go. Thank you. Probably more questions than comments. Um, so what is the current ridership on Saturdays for the number 10? Because you're thinking of eliminating that in November, correct? correct. So what is its current ridership? Yes. And do you want to answer or do you want me to answer? Them? Okay. Okay. So, so I'm pretty sure that it's 71 for the day, but I am going, oh, my copy is under this. But I no longer trust my memory for anything. And it's actually 70, not 71. So on the number 10, we run 10 routes a day uh, or 10 runs a day. And we average 70 riders, so that's an average of seven uh, folks uh, per run. It runs 10 times, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, and I, I suppose I could, on weekdays, the ridership on the number 10 is, am I seeing this correctly, 121 on average? You are exactly seeing it correctly. And what, I, I apologize for not knowing the answer to this, but what are the f current fares? Oh, wow. And w can you give us sort of a idea of where fares have gone through the years? Sure. And so um, we stopped collecting fares um, at the very beginning of the pandemic as an infection control measure. We restarted fares on May 20th of this year. <laughs> we restarted with a full price fare of $2 and a discounted rate of $1. Prior to the pandemic, the fare was $1.50 and 75 cents. So there was that increase. Um, however, uh, one of the things that we changed um, is that uh, previously, there had been a higher fare for our commuter and link routes. Um, we chose to standardize our fares, and so those are now also $2. Um, so they actually saw a price decrease. And the reason why we did that is because we found that our um, commuter and link routes are the only routes that have not rebounded from the pandemic. They are still below 50% of what they were before the pandemic. And, uh, and we didn't want to discourage 
um, additional ridership because we thought that we would potentially lose the service altogether if, if the ridership dipped uh, much lower. Um, and then my last question, I promise. Oh, <laughs> do you receive, particularly for like SSTA, do you receive Medicaid? Um, are you reimbursed by Medicaid for so, transport? So SSTA is the Medicaid uh, provider in this area. Mm -hmm. They do receive uh, Medicaid funds in Vermont. Um, the Vermont Public Transit Association, which uh, GMT is a part of, uh, handles Medicaid transportation. Um, we are negotiating with DEVA, uh, Department of Vermont Health Access, that manages Medicaid on a Medicaid bus pass program. Uh, we have a great plan uh, that would allow us uh, to be able to have somebody um, essentially get a free bus pass if they're on Medicaid and they have no vehicle in their household and they live within three quarters of a mile of a fixed route. Um, but in order for DIVA to uh, authorize that, CMS has to approve. DIVA is going through the process of getting CMS. And I'm sorry, CMS is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, uh, it's a federal agency. And, uh, and so they're going through the process of getting that approved. And we were hoping to have it approved um, back in May 20th. Uh, but, you know, federal uh, uh, government wheels sometimes go slower than we'd like. And so we're still waiting for that. I just, I, I do know that DIVA is currently reworking how they pay um, fares for, you know, Medicaid transport. And I didn't know if that would positively affect you because it is expected to increase reimbursements. Yes, and so it will positively affect GMT's rural operations. Okay. And so one of the things that uh, we are almost unique um, that outside of California, we, th we think there's only one other transit agency um, in the country that has both an urban and rural transit mission because they're funded by different FTA programs. And so uh, our service that's in Washington County and in Franklin County uh, does, is the Medicaid provider. And so, so the work at the legislature to, imp uh, legislature to improve uh, Medicaid funding will help GMT rural. It won't impact GMT urban. Yeah. Yeah, those funds can't be commingled yes. between the two systems. Okay. So yeah. what benefits rural doesn't impact urban where the yeah. service cuts are now? In, in many ways, GMT is like uh, two separate transportation agencies with a common management team. Thank you. Anybody else want it next? You probably don't probably need the mic. But anyway, so how often do you do this count to get your numbers? For this report. All right. Okay. And so we do um, an annual ride check. And, uh, and so every year, um, we pay people to go out and actually count the people that get on and off the buses and at the particular stops. I am heartened to, uh, to say that with our new fare system, we'll be able to get you know, some more automated uh, reporting on that. Uh, of course, we've only had that in operation for about four months now. Um, and uh, we're hoping to be able to, uh, we have some capital funds um, that uh, we are hoping to get automatic passenger counters so that then we would have passenger counts happening all of the time and uh, it would be more than just a once a year check. Because I'm wondering how like the, the students that ride in the morning and the afternoon impact your numbers because that's only the school year and then there's no one riding in the summer yes, it's, versus it's, I'm, so what you what you we pick April because we want to make sure that um, and it's we, we do it during the times when the schools are not in break because we want to make sure that we're capturing those student riders and we do know uh, that that will dip in the summer times and uh, and so that it, so that snapshot in April is not exactly we can't just you know multiply it by 12 and be like oh that's the whole year right. and uh, uh, so we do know that that happens but but these counts um, are based on uh, uh, so the students would be counted in this so it's just, but you're only counting once a year is that what you're saying yes yeah and we recognize that that doesn't make sense in this day and age and we're moving to fix it. And my other question, how does your driver shortage impact this decision? 
So the driver shortage, um, just because you know the way things work, we had just gotten to the point where our driver shortage was no longer an issue. And because we had had some really good success, um, we increased our pay to $30 an hour and uh, that attracted uh, new applicants. Uh, there was also a situation where um, a provider in Williston uh, that had a lot of CDL uh, drivers employed with them went bankrupt and we inherited some of their riders. And so, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it seems funny to me that like, great, you know, we worked so hard to get riders and, or not riders, but drivers, and now we're in a situation where we may have to lose, you know, some of them. Well, and you obviously didn't hear the radio announcement today where they had to shut down two lines because they don't have a driver today. Which, uh, mm -hmm. which one was North Avenue, and I don't remember what your other one was, but it's all over the radio this afternoon. So I was concerned that if you've already got a driver shortage now, if, is this the reason that? Well, I know that one of the, I knew, I knew that we had one drop. I didn't know that we had two. Um, and that one drop was for a mechanical failure uh, on the bus. But but we're actually, you know, right in, in urban, we have enough drivers to perform our full service. In Washington County, we are still on reduced service because we have not been able to, uh, to get enough drivers. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, and I also wanted to make sure that I think she just she just stepped out, but Catherine Sonic, who's our, um, in our in the town, that also helped us like secure the space and all of that. So, um, uh, I wanted to ask about the revenues that aren't on the sheet because we see the costs for the rides, but we don't see how they're offset and um, and I know that. I've asked this before and it was it was an issue with since we haven't been charging fares we we can't calculate the revenues yet um, but uh, I know that you got, we're gonna get that data at some point this fall and so what I can tell you is that this week um, uh, I met with our finance director to look at our first quarter um, we're finding that once we control for um, uh, the, um, the sort of like a, a um, when we first went to fairs, people bought like a bunch of transit at once. And so it's like, oh, we're making so much money, but it was just like people, you know, buying their passes because we're just restarting. When we control for that and we look at our first uh, quarter's results, we see that we're going to be slightly under uh, the projections that we uh, were hoping to make. We were hoping to get um, 1.4 million. Uh, from fair revenue in this fiscal year. It looks like it's going to be somewhere between 1.2 and 1.3, but that's only, you know, if the projections from the past uh, three months, you know, uh, continue to, to hold. Um, one and a half of those months are during a slower time for us anyway, and so we're kind of hoping that this will, will, will normalize. Um, but, uh, but our fair revenue we are projecting will be approximately uh, between our fares and our uh, unlimited access agreements, where it's essentially somebody else is paying for the fares, uh, that that will uh, come to about 10% of our urban revenue. Um, the remaining will come from uh, the federal government with about 50%. Um, the municipalities themselves uh, contribute uh, 3.9 million. Uh, VTrans contributes via uh, state tax dollars about 2.6 million, but then also um, flexes additional uh, FTA, Federal Transit Administration funds uh, to us. So the state's contribution includes extra federal contributions just because transit financing has to be as complicated as possible. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so that kind of gives you the breakout of where we, where we get our funds. So I guess my only follow up to that is it, um, if we're looking at cost cutting through um, a, a measure of efficiency of each route, right? Um, will you be able to break down the revenues simply by looking at the number of drivers, or is that th I would imagine that's not exactly the case because you've got some reduced rate and some full rate, and exactly. And and so this has been very challenging for us because. Um, 
Uh, and one of the, because people have asked us like, who these savings actually seem pretty low for the amount of service that you're cutting. And one of the reasons why is because we're treating them as if that was the only cut that was happening. And uh, so let's just um, take the, the, uh, the, the top item there, Jeffersonville commuter. We're projecting $84,000 worth of savings. Well, we actually know that the service costs about $400,000. So why do you only have $84,000 worth of savings? That's because if you cut that route and have, the, we would only have the savings um, associated with the labor costs of that person not operating the route until we have a decision about potentially how many staff we would lay off. That's, you know, where we're going to see the greater savings. And that's where we're not going to really know until we get to a better idea of, of how many folks that we're going to have to, uh, to lay off uh, if we go through with this. I, I can tell you that it costing public, I, my career has been in human services. Um, I came to, to GMT because I saw that as an extension of, of, you know, uh, of human services. And I thought to myself, oh man, after dealing with, with Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, after dealing with long-term care regulations, you know, public transit financing is going to have to be simple. Mm -hmm. Ooh. And just, just measuring the cost of our business is, is, is very uh, difficult to do. Uh, changing our service, it, it generally takes, you know, six to 12 months, um, you know, to be able to, uh, to go through with the process. And so it, it's really difficult for us, um, you know, to, to, to come up with the real, you know, the real cost values. Yeah. And I just want to add to that fact, to that in terms of account accounting, um, the effects of losing a route you know, if we had to try to account for the, the, the lost um, economic benefits, um, climate benefits, and equity benefits of not having access to transportation, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about a lot, a lot more than 2.2 million. You know, one of the things that I'm going to be taking with a different approach uh, this year at the legislature is that um, and, uh, you know, the transportation committees um, uh, are, are where public transit um, lives because that's where transit funding comes from the Federal Transit Administration. But the impact of service reductions isn't felt by the transportation committees. It's felt by the health care committee, it's by the human services committee, by uh, uh, labor, you know, uh, committees that are focused on getting people into work. And so I think that one of the things that we need to make sure is that uh, those other committees um, that care whether the number 11 that goes right by the methadone clinic gets cut, you know, they're probably going to have an opinion about that. And they're going to say to themselves, how much money am I going to have to spend getting, you know, people to the clinic every day if this route is cut? because it'd be a lot more expensive than GMT providing that, that service. I have a question. Um, you had said that the um, SSTA, the rate was going up to $4? Yes, and so uh, right now um, the, the, it's $3 uh, for ADA service. Is that one way or a round trip? That's one way, yes. And so, um, so if you are using ST, SSTA's door-to-door -door service and, and you are paying a fare, then you're probably using the ADA service. If you're not paying a fare, then it's probably the O&D service. And so um, it can be confusing because SSTA will, you know, maybe on the, even the same bus, they'll be moving somebody that's part of the Medicaid program, they'll be moving somebody that's part of the uh, ADA program, and somebody that may be on the O&D program, all on the same bus. I'm sorry, can you look for O&D? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, it's Older Persons and Disabilities. It used to be called E&D, but Elderly Persons and Disabled was, was, you know, we wanted to use uh, better language. So it could cost a senior $8 to go to the market? It's a lot of money. It absolutely is, it absolutely is. And especially, did you say that um, the regular bus service is two dollars and something cents. Yes. So, so the the full price service uh, would be uh, two dollars, 
most of the folks that would be eligible for the ADA service though would, would receive the discount uh, so that it would be a $2 round trip uh, for those folks as opposed to the $8. Okay, but for those people that, I mean, $8 is a lot of money to go to the market or to the, and if I had to pay $8, I wouldn't go to the library. I, I think that you know, that's totally reasonable and, um, um, and you know, not shockingly, um, returning to fares uh, for our ADA service has resulted in a decrease in the number of ADA rides that are being provided. Now, the good news is, is that that's helping our overall financial situation. The bad news is by impacting people who are you know, unable to use the fixed route because of a disability. So it's, it's, it's uh, I don't want to say it's dirty money, but it doesn't necessarily feel great to get that savings. Well, I hope whoever keeps in mind that v Vermont is a really lonely, cold place during the winter. And without transportation or without reasonably priced transportation, I would have to stay home. I, I couldn't afford that. And, and add to that, um, the state of Vermont, um, is has the oldest population in the country. Sometimes I, th I think Maine and, and, and us sometimes go back and forth on that. Um, but we know that a higher percentage of our uh, people living in this area, you know, would be likely to need that extra assistance with transportation uh, than in other areas. Behind. Okay. Hello. <laughs> So um, I think I don't have any questions. <laughs> I actually just have a statement, I think, for whoever is, is listening in terms of funding, um, that we know public transportation is freedom, right? I think we've touched on that. Um, and how important is freedom to move around, to socialize, to do d you know, one's daily needs. Um, I think of um, the older population and I think of the younger population. I ride the 10 probably two to four times a week, depending. Um, and I see not only a lot of people who are coming from, you know, my age group and older, but I'm seeing a lot of younger people too who may not necessarily have a lot of options um, in terms of getting around, seeing their friends, doing what they need to do. So it's about that. And, um, you know, transportation, access to transportation is about climate. There is no... There are no mathematics that exist that preserve a survivable climate without public transportation being part of that solution. So, um, yeah, so for those who are listening in terms of financials, that's what it means. Um, some of us have changed our lives to make it possible, and it would be a shame to lose that option. And um, earlier when I joked about my inability to do this without the help of staff, I just realized that one of the things that the staff asked me to do was make sure everybody introduces themselves so that when we transcribe <laughs> this, that we know who said what. And I'm like, oh, I failed again. And so could you just, what is your name? My name is Deanna Vida. Deanna Vida, and your name is? Debbie Gregory. Debbie Gregory, and we have Alyssa Black, our representative. We have uh, Lenora Dodds, our representative, and our select board. Don Hill Flurry. Don Hill Flurry. And has anybody else spoke yet? So I think we covered everybody. All right. I think everybody has spoken, but I I can tell that my district mate wants to say something. <laughs> I do want to ask. Do you work at CTE? I do actually. Yeah. I'm a pre-tech two teacher. So. I, I, I got my <laughs> LNA license through their program no, uh, a couple of years ago. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here and everyone who uh, was uh, instrumental in getting this meeting together. Uh, I'm Ray Garofano. I represent. Uh, Chinden 23 that has uh, part of Essex that is being impacted by these proposed changes. And, uh, you know, we're running for re-election and part of that is talking to voters and we have just heard a lot from folks saying the negative impact that this these proposed changes will have on our community. And, uh, you know, it's, um, we touched on this, but it's the long-term impact, the negative impact to a community, to vulnerable people to young younger generation that are losing their freedom and um, to our older vulnerable population that uh, needs that freedom and freedom of movement. And so um, I just 
you know, I know it's they're difficult decisions, and I know you're hearing this from every community, I'm sure, that is, you know, on your proposal list, but, you know, we're kind of on the edge of we're not really quite walkable <laughs> in Essex, as you know, and, uh, you know, I have been canvassing and have been like, oh, you know, and my district mate is on the transportation committee, so she has a lot more um close understanding to this but like just walking on the streets is kind of like wow like our public transportation system needs a lot of work uh, but having that benefit of just uh, some freedom of movement for folks and then I'll also add that I'm on the human services committee and um, I really do implore you to come and talk to us about the impact on this for those that are affected by um, you know, are in our jurisdiction in the House of Representatives. Thank you so much. I, I'm going to be looking for your assistance in gaining access. I'm happy to help. Hi, I'm Brian Donahue from Essex Westford School District. Could you just help me with the math of how you get to cost by per rider? Because it seems like that's probably something you have your eye on as you're taking a look at route reduction and, and so the cost for riders uh, that we see on this list came from uh, a VTrans report that's called the route performance report and it basically takes all of our ridership numbers data um, all of our financial reporting data uh, to then come up with a byline uh, cost per rider and and so this is something that you can um, if you uh, just do a Google search on VTrans route performance, it will show you uh, that for uh, the performance for every single public transit route in the state. And then you would be able to see um, how urban transit compares to, to rural transit, uh, how commuter transit compares to local transit, um, uh, the tourist uh, transit for like the, the ski mountain areas. Um, and what you're going to see is, is that uh, you know, there's big differences in cost uh, based on the, uh, the type of transit. And so the, the most efficient year-round local service um, is the urban local service where we're going to have um, anywhere from like a, a 6 to $8 cost per rider uh, for a successful route. When you look at rural transit, which is generally moving less folks, um, you're looking at more of a 16 to $18 cost per rider. Um, uh, and then when you look at uh, commuter routes, um, you know, it, those are frequently in the you know, 20s, 30s and higher uh, for, for those costs. And, uh, and so that's where that uh, particular uh, figure. Do you know the year for the data? It came from fiscal year 23 because they won't have fiscal year 24 data until January. Yeah. Do you know that report's done on an annual basis? Um, there's a significant change in ridership when we change school times. Um, the Route 10 was optimized on the old school times. We haven't been successful to optimize it on the new school times, um, which might lead you to calculate numbers based upon route time decisions rather than ridership decisions. So let me uh, uh, thank you for that reminder. And what I'll do is I'll make sure that uh, I go with the planning department and so that we will look further back uh, to see if, uh, um, if it had higher ridership, um, then it would lead me to believe to j just exactly what you had said, uh, is that potentially that is more about the, uh, the time of the, the route as opposed to the, uh, whether the route is you know, uh, a good investment or not. Okay, thank you. Hi, Irene Renner, Senator for not just part of Essex, but also Milton, Westford, and Fairfax. That's okay. Not a problem. Um, I am also very concerned to see any part of Route 10 cut. Um, this is the first I've heard um, about Milton being combined with St. Albans. Sounds like that's not necessarily a loss for the Milton folks. So thank you for that. Um, I'm wondering, always a contrarian in some way, how do we frame the cost of a bus ride for people to understand and put it in context that, you know, maybe you rode the bus for a quarter as a kid, but like there's inflation, a lot of time has passed, a gallon of gas costs a lot of money, 
Uh, when I watch that Jeffersonville, that Jeffersonville bus go, it's huge. Isn't there a smaller bus we could take up to that route to save money? I don't know. I just, I have so many questions about how we expect a bus to cost two bucks to take us somewhere that we have to go to work or to school. And, and is some of that on us to readjust our expectations? I don't know. Thank you. Um, I think that because you mentioned it, every, every public uh, meeting has had the same question. Why don't you have some smaller buses for less busy times? And so uh, Representative Dodge is probably sick of hearing the answer, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to uh, go into it. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, when you look at GMT's urban operation, 100% um, of our urban buses can operate on 100% of our urban routes. And we do that um, for cost savings when it comes to parts, when it comes to training our mechanics, um, when it comes to having the flexibility where, as we just heard today, uh, we had a bus breakdown and we lost, we had to drop a run. Um, this way we don't have to worry about having the right bus to fill the run. Um, but the cost savings uh, between a full-size city bus and the smaller buses is only fuel. And the, the reason why is because um, our full-size city buses are more like ships than, than a car. They last a long time. About a third of our fleet is over 12 years old. And so the cost of a 40-foot uh, bus traditionally has been about $600,000, and it will last at least 12 years. The cost of a smaller bus um, will be about 300000 roughly half of the cost, but it lasts half the time. And so, um, and so we're, you would still be paying the driver the same amount, still be, um, uh, we would have a higher um, uh, maintenance costs. Um, and so it's just the, that, that gasoline is, is or the diesel uh, that is the, uh, the difference. I will say that, uh, and I should have mentioned this uh, before, but I forgot. Uh, we did reach out to Rural Community Transit, which operates in uh, the Morrisville area and the Northeast Kingdom area to see if they would be willing uh, to pick up the, the Jeffersonville uh, commuter. We uh, were hoping uh, that uh, with their smaller vehicles and that since we know that they're already transporting some people to Burlington uh, for Medicaid and other things that they would potentially be able to pick up that route, they did a cost analysis and saw that it would be a problematic cost for them as well. Um, um, one of the things that I am happy to report is that one of Jeremy's um, uh, co-workers uh, at VTrans, a great uh, fellow by the name of uh, Dan Courier, um, has committed himself to, to riding uh, the Jeffersonville commuter and actually approaching strangers and saying, hi, I work at VTrans. We want to find alternative ways for you to, you know, to get in uh, uh, on, on this route. Here's our van pool options. Here's our carpool options. Um, so that uh, so that if that service does end up going away, uh, that we've moved uh, as many people as possible to alternatives. I just want to staying on the bus thing. Say your name. Say your name before you talk. For the transcribers, my name is Leonora Dodge. I'm the rep from the town of Essex and part of city of Essex Junction, and I sit on house transportation. So. Um, this is going to be, you know, the nerdy transportation talk, but also uh, on the bus question, the cost of the buses is like really the least of our worries because um, that's the capital expense is actually covered at a rate of 80% for a combustion engine, you know, vehicle for the bus and 90% for an electric bus. So that's not the that's not necessarily the bucket to where we will uncover a bunch of money it's really about staffing um uh yeah i just wanted to make sure that we did that and and i and i want to take the opportunity also to mention that uh, just as we heard earlier that we can't transfer money from rural to urban we also can't transfer capital to operating because um somebody brought up to me didn't you just buy $8 million worth of electric buses? 
yes, we bought eight million dollars. Its capital is funded through separate programs. If I could use that eight million in operating, no offense to the electric buses, I would rather have eight million in operating. But unfortunately, that's not enough uh, uh, available. I'm sure they're not hurt. <laughs> yeah, they have. Been, yeah. Um, Alyssa Black again, and I just keep coming up with questions as I'm staring at all these numbers. I mean, I'm assuming that there are certain routes or certain times that are more utilized than others. Um, and I'm also thinking about some of the um, major companies that are uh, located on the number 10 and whether or not some of that ridership is generated by employees there and if we explored you know, possibly s some subsidies coming from, since those are their employees. And, and so I'm not aware of any of the manufacturing along the Sand Hill area or where the number 10 is um, having um, agreements with us for fares. Um, you know, certainly that's something that um, uh, we should proactively reach out to them about um, if the service is retained. Um, I can tell you that uh, you know, one of the things that uh, has made this situation so much more challenging is that over the past 12 years, we have seen a 38% reduction in our non-operational staff. And so these are the managers, these are the outreach coordinators, these are the people that go to knock on a door to say, hey, would you like to sign up for an unlimited access program for your employees? Um, it's one of the this um, having the lower administrative staff has made this exercise so much harder because we just don't have the internal expertise and capacity uh, that we used to have and that to me is an example of um, if we were more healthily funded I would be knocking on the door of every employer in the area to say why don't you have an unlimited access program for your folks and the reason why that's key for our financial success is that fair revenue, oddly enough, the federal government doesn't consider it local match. And so we can't use fair revenue, um, you know, when it comes to, you know, the, the match for capital buses, the, the match for operating. Payment in lieu of fares is considered local match. And so if, if we get $100,000 from fares, it, we can't, you, it's good, it's helpful to us, but it's not as useful as it could be. If we get $100,000 in payment in lieu, that's like the, what we need most, the, the, local, the local match. And I just, I want to reiterate something that Representative Garifano said. Um, I sit on healthcare and, you know, we have a constant refrain of housing is healthcare, but transportation is also healthcare. And we know how vital it is but I did want to acknowledge Senator Renner as well. <clears throat> Things cost. And, you know, sometimes we have to be willing to pay for what we're utilizing. And sometimes transportation is one of those things. And, you know, I have been going to the State House since 2002 uh, to represent organizations. Nobody at the State House was having any fun last session. I have never seen legislators more depressed, more, more cranky, more, you know, like, because I'm like, man, I, am so, like, I used to have dreams of, oh, I'm going to retire and be a legislator, and pff, I am <laughs> no thank you. Uh, so you all are dealing with heavy, difficult decisions, and I appreciate your service. Thank uh, Thank you, Clayton. <laughs> um, although I always smile when I see you come into the building <laughs> or into the committee. Um, I wondered about the kind of really innovative, outside the box, like very different thinking that you guys have been engaging in, as I've heard, that, um, th that you are prevented in some way to accessing certain grants because you're set up as kind of like a municipal charter. Could you speak some more about changes for for that, like how you have the structure, your, your makeup, your structural um, kind of corporate makeup and how changing that 
may open you up to being able to apply for other funding. Absolutely. And so I'm trying to be an optimist here. <laughs> because we have, we have to have optimism here. Um, so uh, we're not looking to change us from being a municipality, but at um, our September board meeting, uh, we authorized the creation of a nonprofit um, partnership, uh, uh, an affiliated nonprofit. So it'll be the Green Mountain Transit uh, Foundation and Association. Um, uh, so we're going through the process of registering with the Secretary of State and then the longer process with the IRS. Um, this will then allow us to do um, direct fundraising, um, which you know, frankly, I'm not sure that that's really going to be very helpful. But what will be helpful is, especially in the human services world, there's a whole lot of grant opportunities that are um, available to uh, to nonprofits that are not available to municipalities, and we wanted to be a, 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 an ability to uh, a compete for those. And so, to give you an idea of like what would one of those things be, um, we actually just uh, submitted. Uh, grant applications uh, to the state's MTI program, which is the Mobility Technology and Innovation Program. And uh, so one of our applications um, is something where uh, anytime one of our uh, passengers um, violates the code of conduct and, you know, we may have to no trespass them that says, hey, you can't ride because you're, you know, uh, scaring other passengers, maybe you, you're involved in a fight or some kind of altercation. And so one of the things that we um, have applied for and we've received um, an informal um, approval that we're gonna get is so that we would be able to offer behavioral counseling to everybody who ends up on our no trespass list. So that instead of right now, we just say, hey, you've been naughty, you can't ride for three months, go away. And that may be a person who needs daily dosing at the San Remo Clinic. That may be somebody that is gonna lose their job and then spiral out of control. And so instead of just leaving them uh, to deal with their issues, uh, we're gonna, in each of our three service areas, we're gonna contract, um, uh, hopefully find a provider that has capacity to do this and then pay for behavioral counseling sessions in the hope of being able to get people then back on the bus. And so, um, and maybe this is just because as a former human services person, I kind of, you know, my hammer is helping people, you know, in that way. And so I try to, and so that's the tool I use for everything. Um, and so I see us really, you know, um, competing for um, substance abuse and mental health um, uh, 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 grants um, because it's, it's not an accident that a lot, the, the many, a higher proportion of the people using our service you know, are experiencing addiction issues, are experiencing mental health issues. And that if we can provide, instead of thinking about how to um, get people to using transit to the uh, to service, how about we just provide service where there's transit? And uh, so that's the type of thing that I will be uh, uh, working towards. And would, would those be the kinds of contributions that would leverage federal I think that, that it, would, it would be able to, um, number one, help allay safety concerns because we know from um, uh, polling our riders that one of the big things that discourages folks from using it is because of the perceived lack of safety. So if we can improve safety, then that's going to be um, a help to our bottom line for both revenue from, from fares and um, having the, uh, the ridership that would, you know, uh, show that transit's working and should grow instead of going in the opposite direction. Hi, Irene Runner, Senator again. Two questions. One is, have the electric buses been through a winter and how are they doing? Because I know in another town the school gave them up because <laughs> they were not what they were cracked up to be. Um, several years ago, we received two electric buses from a company called Proterra. Those buses are about million dollar paperweights. They, uh, they just did not perform in the way that we would want them to. Um, the, the good news is, as Senator Dodge, or Representative Dodge uh, mentioned earlier, 
you know, 90% of those costs were paid for by the federal government. So, you know, our local taxpayers were not on the hook for, for that. Um, this past year, we received five um, additional electric buses from New Flyer. Um, we have not been through them uh, through a winter yet, but they are greatly exceeding our expectations uh, for range uh, to including during the summer months when we had the AC, you know, cranked up high. Um, and we are um, cautiously optimistic uh, that they will be able to meet our needs much more than uh, their Proteras. One of the reasons why that's critical, um, Representative Dodge is going to hear uh, when she goes back to the, uh, the state houses, because you're going to be reelected, yeah. of course, yes. <laughs> you know, um, that um, the FTA this past year has really clamped down on funding the purchase of new industrial uh, um, ice uh, in internal, internal combustion, combustion engines. engines like ah I, 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 my too many, too many acronyms and so like this the state of vermont application for for new vehicles um that we do every year was just we did not get nearly what we were hoping for and it looks like um we're going to be really dependent on what are called low no vehicles, which is low or no emission vehicles uh, in the future uh, to, to get our vehicle needs met. Welcome so much for people who are just joining us. And uh, what I could just ask is whenever it's convenient, if you could sign in. And um, I provided a, an overview of the situation and uh, now we are just um, answering people's questions. Um, feel free to answer, ask uh, anything that you like. Feel free to make any comment um, um, that you would like. We have our friends with CCTV who are going to be broadcasting this on local channel 17. And so there is a, a microphone that's going around. And if you could just speak into the microphone so the folks on TV can hear um, if you have a comment. And, uh, but welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. I want to read the scene. Oh, you may not like this. <laughs> well, I, I, I will quietly, I will quietly uh, uh, not in approval. You know, internal, internal not of approval. Yeah. My second question has to do with: um, Have you talked to anyone at the Economic Development Commission here in town? Because they're always looking for projects, and if you wanted to partner with them to go to, say, the businesses up in Saxon Hill. Um, maybe you could find some volunteer help in contacting those businesses because before you shut down the routes, we might want to uh, confirm that they do or don't have people that could benefit. Thanks. Thank you. I, Senator Renner, I love that suggestion because one of the things that uh, we're really relying on is, is you know, using our friends because uh, uh, with our capacity diminished, um, we've really been able to like our friends at the CCRPC, the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission, you know, are super helpful to us. And, um, um, and so reaching out to the economic development is a great idea. Thank you so much. Hi, I could speak to that a little bit. Um, my name is Catherine Sonic, and I'm the Community Development Director for the town. And I, I do know that the Economic Development Commission is um, in, in tune with this, but they've also been thinking about, especially the Saxon Hill area where we have a lot of our industrial businesses, uh, how are those folks getting to work? Um, you know, there's a, a shortage of employees there, so there's a, a need to fill some vacancies. And so thinking about where can they draw on uh, a population that just needs to get there, they, they need a ride. So they've been looking recently um, at, at working with CAPMA to try to do a study that would get an idea of where um, current employees are coming from and then trying to figure out ways to get more employees there. So, um, you know, CAPMA is on their radar, is work, working with them, I, and I know um, GMT has come up as well, but definitely we'll, I'll mention that to them just to, to make sure that they're, they're thinking of you as well. Um, and so um, CATMA is the Chittenden Area Transportation Management Association. Um, they uh, are a real uh, critical partner for GMT. Um, they work uh, with us, uh, when I mentioned those unlimited access programs, uh, they help us negotiate with some of the biggest uh, employers in the area, including uh, the hospital, UVM, and Champlain uh, College. Um, and so working with CATMA is a great idea. 
Well, while I have the microphone, I, I've been wanting to say a couple of things as well. Um, as the community development director, um, in tune with uh, a lot of our different boards and committees, um, the Economic Development, development Committee is one, but also our Housing Commission, our Conservation and Trails Committee, our Energy Committee, and all of them have their eye on, on um, affordable housing, biking and walking, um, alternative forms of transportation in general. And losing the, the number 10, I think it would really be detrimental for Essex, for our town center that we're uh, so eagerly excited to be developing right now w with our separation from Essex Junction. Th that is our downtown. And it's hard to have a downtown, I think, without transit um, to, to get people to and from. So whether it's bringing people from the outside in or, or, or transporting our folks around town or, or to their um, to their jobs. Uh, it's also the place where we really want to see our affordable housing, so higher density housing. And for that, I think you really do need the, the transit option. Um, I've also spoken with our town librarian and she, uh, when we were talking about where we might move our town offices, our town library, she said, well, it has to be on a transit route because we want, as, as you mentioned, we want people, every, everyone in Essex to be able to get there. Uh, so I, th I see that as very important. Um, the Planning Commission um, asked me to deliver a letter to you. Um, I'm happy to read it into the record. I also can just hand it to you. I don't know if, if anyone else... Yeah, you do? <laughs> if that's okay. It's two pages, but it's really only one page. The re second page is signatures. Um, in reviewing the most recent iteration of the Green Mountain Transit plans to reduce service over the subsequent two fiscal years, the Essex Planning Commission would like to offer our strong objections to the elimination of bus route number 10, the Essex Williston Loop. A quick look at the GMT map of planned service reductions would show why we feel this loss keenly. According to the figures offered there, the number of persons within a quarter mile of a bus stop is projected to drop from approximately 70,000 in fiscal year 25 to approximately 59,000 in fiscal year 26. Upon the elimination of Route 10 and thousands of, residents ex of Essex residents are included in that number. But our preliminary objection does not pertain to the current residents of Essex so much as it pertains to the impact of Essex's future growth. Over the past five years, the Essex Planning Commission devoted numerous public hearings and work sessions to crafting two complementary visions, the Essex Town Center Next Plan and the Essex Town Plan. The former was approved by the Select Board in 2021, and the latter was approved by voters of the town in 2024. Each plan designates a quarter along Route 15 from the intersection with Route 289 to its intersection with Sand Hill Road as the area most suitable for dense residential and commercial growth in the near term. This designation was based on the fact that the residents named affordable housing as a top priority for future development, as well as the fact that this quarter, corridor was the most infrastructure rich corridor in Essex. Simply put, this was the only section of town where dense res residential development would make sense. Accordingly, we find the following passage in on transit oriented development in our town plan, and this is in quotes. Green Mountain Transit has identified the Vermont Route 15 corridor between Burlington and Essex Center as a priority for transit oriented and pedestrian oriented development. To make the best of GMT's resources and promote future improvements in service and thus attract more riders, future development and enhancements of pedestrian environment of the pedestrian environment should be focused along the Route 15 corridor, particularly in the Essex Town Center. End quote. We are also seeing the following state and regional efforts to develop transportation links in and out of Essex shall be supported, including rail service, alternative transit systems and regional multimodal transportation options. By proposing to end all bus service in the town of Essex within two years, GMT will undermine one of the central pillars of our town plan, which will have a direct and negative impact on the town's ability to be a regional growth center. Given the shared municipal, regional, and statewide goals of building affordable housing 
in walkable and transit friendly communities, we strongly object to the proposed reductions in service. Signed, the Town of Essex Planning Commission. So thank you so much for reading that out. Thank you to the Planning Commission for preparing that. When I talked earlier about how uh, positive these meetings have been, it's because so much real, you know, you know, I, um, when, when people come in and just say, hey, don't cut our service and, you know, um, you know, we, we can feel for it, but those specifics, you know, I think that that's really going to be helpful for decision makers uh, to realize. And I heard, so, uh, last night I was at Jericho's uh, select board and heard such a similar thing. We have developments coming in where we've told folks that they don't have to have so much parking because it's going to be on a bus line and you're going to cut our bus, you know, our bus line. You know, what are we going to do now? Because we're not going to have enough parking spaces for these spots. So you're absolutely right that this change in infrastructure, because that's really what transit is, is infrastructure. Um, people made, uh, I think, reasonable assumptions that that infrastructure would continue to be there. I have a cold. I don't, did someone bring up the school? I had to, oh, I'm Gina Barrett. I live on Sand Hill Road in Essex Town. I grew up in the junction. So we've heard previous feedback about uh, the new school times not aligning well mm -hmm. uh, with the bus routes uh, or the bus timing and that that may contribute to the lower ridership. Yeah. But certainly if you would like to talk about the impact uh, uh, to getting a student to the school, yep. I, would, I would love to I even that. brought my student. This is my student. She rides the bus every morning. When I grew up in the junction, I used to watch my dad take the bus to GE way back in the 70s. And we lived in the junction. We could walk to school activities, but we couldn't, you know, we also learned how to get to Burlington and hang out and do kids stuff. But when you live in the town, that's your only access to the high school. So you're going to exclude kids from participating in activities. And she learned how to ride the bus in the morning. And she wants to talk too, which is good. She learned how to ride the bus in the morning, which is an invaluable skill in the world at large that she is using an environmentally friendly system to get around when she gets older. She uses it almost every day. And then on weekends, she also can get in. And if I am lucky enough that I work from home, if you're a parent that you're working, you can't get your kid to and from school, it cuts off your options from taking the school bus. So I, it's really important on top of that aside i volunteer at the food shelf on the weekend out in essex town that's on route 15. we have clients that come in that use the bus and would not be able to access the, the our service hi i'm alice barrett i um am a school student an essex high school student um if the transit line was taken away from us uh, it would leave a bunch of other students that I know that wouldn't have an easy and accessible way to get to school. The other way would be the school bus, which some people are too far away or their parents can't drive them in. Uh, since it's so close to the school, it's the most easy op option and reliable. Um, yeah. Alice, thank you so much. What grade are you in? Uh, I'm in uh, junior. Junior. <laughs> <laughs> junior. My, uh, my stepdaughter just started. Uh, she's in ninth grade this year, uh, Madeline Williams. So if you if you uh, know her, you could say that you, you gave feedback to her stepdad. So thank you so much. Okay. There you go. Um. So, hi, my name is Ryan Wallace. Um, I'm with the Teamsters Union. Uh, the Teamsters Union represents the bus drivers and the mechanics at GMTA. Um, and I think it's important to mention that the impact of any route cut um, could be, you know, very detrimental to our local community. Um, route cuts for us, selfishly as Teamsters, mean that our bus drivers and mechanics get laid off. Um, Clayton, as you just mentioned, um, Shortly after GMT just, you know, successfully reached their driver staffing goal, um, all of a sudden, you know, the threat of laying drivers off um, is a pretty tough pill to swallow. Um, and then the mindset of cut this route due to low ridership 
but keep this route due to, you know, more ridership um, is really a tough idea to wrap my head around when all routes that are currently in today play such an essential role in everyday public transportation. Um, you know, not one route is more important than the other just because that's what the numbers say, and I, I can't stress that enough. Um, cutting public transportation, um, especially here in the, you know, town of Essex, um, would be truly a catastrophic step in the wrong direction. Um, this service reduction plan estimates throughout the next six months, um, 750 rides impacted, um, which is, uh, you know, ultimately going to result in more cars on the road every day, uh, which is going in the, the wrong direction that the state was hoping to go. You know, the last few years, they've had great incentives for EVs, um, you know, for personal use um, that the state has offered, um, but all of a sudden, they're, they're willing to sacrifice uh, that by cutting public transportation. Um, so more cars, you know, on the road every day, people going to and from work to appointments, uh, school, so on and so forth. Um, and then also, you know, for some could ultimately result in the loss of employment. I know I had mentioned the bus drivers and mechanics, um, but also those who live on the bus line who rely on public transportation to get to and from work. Um, you know, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, not having that as an option, um, truly a step in the wrong direction. So, um, I strongly encourage those who took the time out of their uh, night tonight to, uh, you know, make your voice heard. Um, contact your leaders in your local communities, um, your legislators. Let this, let them know that this must be prevented. Um, you know, especially here, right in our local community. So, thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much. You know. Um, at one of the earlier uh, uh, public meetings, I was uh, rendered almost speechless for a few seconds, which, you know, I, I, I talk and talk and talk, so that's a rare thing. Um, because one of the lines that we were looking to cut uh, was a, uh, um, it's the Lakeside compu Commuter. It just runs one run a day from the GMT uh, offices to the Downtown Transit Center. <laughs> it averages three riders a day. And wouldn't you know it, one of those three riders was at the meeting and he was talking eloquently about the fact that it doesn't matter that it's only moving three. Here is how important it is to my day. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I just think you're absolutely right, uh, uh, Ryan, that um, you know if, if you are a person who is on a line and it's not moving a lot of people, it doesn't mean that it's not as important to you as the other ones. It's just as important to you. Um, the, uh, uh, let's see, um, uh, I had another thought that went in and then went right back out. Uh, hopefully I'll remember it though and, and, and uh, I'll throw it out there. Hi, I'm Lorraine Zaloom. Um, I live in Essex Center. I live right on Route 15. I am sister to that one over there and auntie to that one there. I'm small town community, sister-in-law over there. Um, <laughs> just to point people out, but um, as, as a small community and someone who grew up in Essex Junction, who greatly valued the bus system, who grew up with father, who utilized that so that we, we were a family of six and seven years, and uh, as people who raise children know, in terms of trying to get kids to sports events, things like that, we were greatly, heavily invested in bus, busing because we had one car that allowed our family to have one car. We, our goal is to reduce climate change, to help climate change by reducing carbon. In terms of what we value for those three riders that are on that one route, do we have an equation that we check, you know, what's the reduction in carbon emissions from those three people? What, in terms of what the cost savings is for that individual that puts more money into the economy as well, because they have more buying power when you're not spending on a car. Cars on average are about $2,000 a year, right, for us to own, maintain, pay for, um, so no matter how you cut it, that's a great value for all of the people who live in Vermont. Also one who lives on Route uh, 15 um, and is very discouraged by the amount of traffic that has been funneled right in front of our house. We live, we have no setback. It is very disturbing to me to add even more cars. Um, it, it, it disrupts our day, the, the noise is unbearable. Uh, it's literally shortening our lives, those people that live as residentials along that area, that corridor. So I would hope that we, We'll keep the buses. I also heard um, a select board member <coughs> who was concerned about the cost of the buses and that there was a 
issue around the electric buses. My understanding is that the, the second fleet is done much better. Um, so I, I hope that that word is going around Vermont that as you do these things that we educate, especially those people that are in leadership positions that are under a false notion that what we're doing is not helping. Um, I think that is very important for us to be proactive because when we're proactive in the long run, we save ta tax dollars. It's all about return on investment. This is a great return on investment. No matter how you slice it, we all know it. We all know that we're trying to reduce cars on the road. We're trying to reduce parking spots. And it really is invaluable for the, the future and for the plan. And also the other thing that uh, to consider is that we're still in an anomalous time post-COVID. And so those numbers that we see, to me, are not really the real numbers yet in terms of who's working from home still and who needs to get a ride. So I really struggle with that kind of math that we're doing right now. And I would also like to know that at the state level that we're chasing federal dollars to support um, what we're trying to do in all of these states. We just saw the massive disaster of Helene. There's no state that's gonna escape that. We know this is coming to Vermont. We've already seen tornado warnings, never in my lifetime. So to me, the, the point now, we, you know, in a 10-year, five-year plan, we need to do this, and we need to do this smartly. So I greatly appreciate doing this. I hope that the state is listening. I hope that, the, that we go to the feds, that our, our federal senator and, and uh, House of Representatives, uh, representative, that they are in tune to this too and get us more monies to, to support this. It shouldn't, to me, be on the communities to fund this. It should be a state and, and federal le level that funds these kind of things, because it's for the good of all. Thank you. I've heard so many times at these meetings that people say, I'm either going to have to buy a car or, I, or I'm going to have to buy another car. Right. And so you're absolutely you know, right. Um, the other thing that we've heard is that I'm living along the bus route, and if I have to move, why am I staying in Vermont? And that's like, oh, man, it's so hard to recruit people already. You know, we need to make sure that if if we force people to move, how many are we going to leave, or how many are going to you know vote with their feet and leave? And I think directly to that, Leonora Dutch, um, I I read through the surveys that were conducted, you know, through a third party, um, to that that surveyed riders, and we don't have any post COVID surveys, but pre COVID. Um, shortly before COVID hit, there was um, there were at least two reports, right? I believe, and um, it was really instructive to really go through those numbers, and 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 you get a very strong picture of the importance of our public transit, and particularly in Vermont, right? Because we have this image as the second whitest state, and you know all this. Uh, and I just, I really want to underline the point that has been made tonight, I think several times, where trying to put a, trying to put a dollar amount to what, you know, to what the cost is versus the benefit. Um, our, our demographic reality, I, I keep, I keep saying the same thing. This is why I ran for office. Um, I grew up in a, a very multicultural city from an immigrant family and chose Vermont as my home 25 years ago because it's beautiful and it's, you know, and it's progressively minded. Um, but we have this myth that uh, we don't have people of color and we don't have young people when the reality is that that's the only population that's actually growing in our state. That is the only growing workforce that we have. Now, Green Mountain Transit disproportionately serves that very population, empowers that very population to live here, work here, and provide the goods and services that we are going to depend on. We would have no future in this state. I have heard it from countless economists. The Joint Fiscal Office released a study that basically said we are doomed economically. And their recommendation was, we need foreign-born populations. We need to change that narrative that the people that you see working the roofs all over Essex 
these days, the people working on the farms all over, the people working in the kitchens at the restaurants, we need, they, they are not a drain on our economy. And that is the partnership that we need in order to nurture them and empower them to work. And same with our seniors. Age Well has been sounding the same drumbeat, and it sounded very, it was very resonant for me as, an, as, as somebody who's concerned about the immigrant narrative, right, in this, in this country. They were like, we are constantly saying, oh, the aging demographic, the aging demographic. Vermont seniors are some of the most vibrant, dynamic, show up to meetings, you know, right? I got an email from this woman saying, can you tell me more about this meeting? I'm going to make it over there. The bus means so much to me. Seniors are volunteering their time. They're not retiring you know, riding off in the sunset and stopping their lives. They are contributing to our state. They are doing grandparent volunteering. They're running our libraries. They're, we have to keep moving our people. And that's what public transit does. And there isn't an agent, there is not an agency, a public transit agency in this country that doesn't get subsidized. So, um, I just really want to stress that when we talk about, oh, well, we, we don't want to pay an extra fee for our car registrations, or we don't want to pay, you know, a higher tax on this or that or whatnot, um, it, it breaks my heart to hear riders. I've come to two of these sessions, and I've attended some virtually, and I hear people who are riding the bus say, I'm willing to pay a little more but that it shouldn't be on those people's backs because they're making all of the right choices that we want them to make. They're trying to get to work, they're trying to stay healthy, and they're trying to ride the bus instead of buying a car. So that's the that's like the last bucket that I want to be trying to get our funding from. Representative Dodge, I so appreciate those comments. Um, you know, I did something for the very first time this past week, and that is that I was a part of a national news story because Marketplace, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, that, and, and so when you hear that story, it's all across the country, uh, public transit is facing this. And what you see is, is that places either do draconian cuts or they come up with new funding models. And, you know, it's easy for me to look at the legislators and say, you know, give me more money. I know that you're under, you know, pressures, but I, I really hope that that's the pathway and not the draconian cuts. Um, I loved your comments about um, the young people, the people of color. If anyone who gets on our buses will know that there's young people and people of color uh, in Vermont and they're using our service. And one of the things that I love most about GMT is that it's the most multicultural workforce uh, that I've been part of since I was in the military. And I love the fact that um, when you look at our, uh, especially amongst our driver team, we have so many new Americans, um, you know, we would not uh, be able to provide uh, nearly the service that we do um, if it weren't for these folks who have come and are contributing so uh, immeasurably to uh, to GMT. Thank you. That almost seemed like a wrap up, <laughs> but but I don't but I don't want to I don't want to, you know. But you know, the oh it's. Uh, Oh, hey. Hi, I just want to speak again. There's every morning I get on and every afternoon I get on. There's so many different people from different backgrounds, people getting to work, getting home. It's just if we did lose this, there's no possible way of like for these people to get where they need to go. And there are it's just a very diverse background and most
most of the time it, I see um, seniors, uh, very young, like teens. And then I also see many people of different color. Many of them do rely on this. And that's the main goal that we should see here. What the people need and the people need this transit line. <laughs> and someone may have already addressed it, but especially having a teen in Essex Town being raised in Essex Junction, our communities are so cut off by the circ. There's no easy way to send a kid, especially in the winter or in the dark, from my house on Sand Hill Road to see friends in Essex Junction. I mean, it, it's also community connectivity. It helps make sure that there is a way, even if you might get a ride, there's still another way to get in and see your friends. And I mean, we're, we're just totally cut off from each other. There's no pedestrian way. What we what we heard from folks is is that hey, that means I can't go out to dinner on a Saturday night. Right. You know that means going to see a, a band play in town is not an option for me. And so it gets back to that whole yeah. There's not a lot of riders on that route, but but eliminating that route narrows the the range of options for the people. I have a question for Mr. Donahue. Since you received the word that this is going to change, how is that going to impact your school bus routes and the amount of people on your buses and times? And the budget. And here you go. <laughs> Thank you, Don. <laughs> um, well, when we changed the times, we changed the um, we changed the entire structure of the transportation network to try to put a toehold in what was collapsing around us at the time. We were just before we changed times. We were we had five rolling cancellations on a daily basis because of the lack of drivers. We've clawed our way back. Um, the stacked approach, so that we do a K five and then we do a, a six twelve route has given us some capacity at the high school level that we didn't have before and a little bit more service for high school level. But we're seeing ridership continuing to grow. We just had the most, it's an opt-in system now. So you have to opt into the system rather than just sort of be given it. Part of that just helps us understand where we are with capacity. But um, you know, last year when we were in the SAC, we had some decent capacity on every bus. Um, that's that's sort of evaporating on us right now. So we know there's no way for us to expand our system. So as people begin to rely more on transit, whether it's yellow school bus or public transit, um, the school district just doesn't have the capacity. We don't, we don't have the drivers. Um, each bus is about $84,000 for us to operate. So um, we've been able to help some of our budget woes by trimming down to we canceled the ghost route that we had had in the budget that we wanted to operate. It was a fourth route in Westford uh, that um, we just decided that it was just no longer sensible to keep that money on the sideline with the inability of getting a driver. Um, so I'm concerned about this. I also know that for high school students particularly, public transit has always been a, a so much more convenient and we transport two times a day on a fixed schedule. People move more than two times a day on a fixed schedule. Um, life for a high school student is very much more dynamic than it is for an elementary school student. Um, as a junior, as a senior, many of them take uh, advantage of an early release time or a late arrival. Uh, that knocks you just completely out of our fixed route system. Um, so, and then we have a lot of participation, probably over 500 kids per season participate in a club or a sport. Um, so they're off our fixed schedule. Um, we need this service. I'd like to use it more. Um, I, you know, I, 
I was a big proponent on safe routes to school, and it needs to be an all of the above process. We need more, we need more bike pedestrian lanes. We need more public transportation. Um, we could use a few more school bus drivers. Um, but you know, we're just seeing a decline in that availability. So I kind of was relying on this. So I'm disappointed to see it. I know that we saved it last time. When we moved over to public transit, we created a seismic shift in ridership on this route and saved it from cutting. It was five years ago, it was scheduled to be cut. Um, and we asked, wait, give us a chance. That's why I'd like to see the math. Like what's the ridership we need? What's the cost effectiveness for it to be? Because I think that the community probably has people on the bubble and we may have some levers that we can pull that can induce greater ridership especially if we know the day you're measuring it. <laughs> so uh, to answer the, the question if, about the data, um, one of the things that we covered earlier is that, uh, believe it or not, in 2024, we, we do a, a annual hand count where we hire uh, people to ride the buses and then uh, you know, mark where people get on or off, um, and then use that to extrapolate uh, the ridership data. Um, we have in the works to get, uh, um, you know, modernization, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, automated passenger counts. It's, it's something that we probably should have done, you know, maybe 20 years ago, and uh, um, so that we would have better data, uh, but uh, we're trying to get there as quickly as possible. Well, I just incredibly appreciate the fact uh, that people care and are here, and it's on a it's a beautiful Friday afternoon, and instead of being out having fun, we're we're talking about our sad uh, sad potential story of, with transit. But the fact is, is that you just made an investment into helping, you know, possibly avoid uh, these situations. Our, our planning letter, which reminds me, I have to get that from you, because that's going to be uh, very important. Yeah. You know, these things are going to be helpful. Um, hearing from the representatives that they're interested in, in having their committees explore this issue, that's going to be, you know, helpful. And uh, so thank you for being part of the solution. Um, I look forward to a time where I'm standing in front of you talking about our innovative new, you know, uh, transportation options for you all. Um, and uh, and hopefully we can get there um, if we move together. So, oh, one more. I was just curious if there was any update on the Montpelier's experiment with microbusing. I think that was two years ago they started it. How did it go? Trans were uh, potentially not going to extend it. Because it, uh, Can you yeah, it, it, uh, uh, we were the first uh, to um, to try microtransit in the state. Um, I think it's fair to say that there's things that both us and VTrans learned. Uh, like one of the things that we learned is that it's a really bad idea to have microtransit that runs along your transit routes, because then people are using that instead of right. the buses. Um, that was problematic. Uh, we learned that with the system that we have, um, especially when it's free, uh, we have people who will, you know, call up, make reservations, we get to their house, they're no-showed, now, you know, we just spent all of this money and, you know, and to get there. And so, um, and so one of the things that, uh, um, and, you know, I, 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 I'm glad that you asked that because it's something that I think is important, especially for our legislators to hear, is that when, uh, when we were at the State House last year, um, this seemed like an urban versus rural issue because, because only GMT Urban was, was, you know, approaching a fiscal cliff. Uh, one of the things they're going to hear this year is that the rural transit agencies are now facing their fiscal cliff. Mm -hmm. VTrans is now making uh, tightening uh, on the rural side. And so it's not just going to be GMT Urban that's facing, you know, potential cuts. And I think that that will then create a more unified um, approach that should be helpful at the legislature. And the potential loss of the MyRide service 
um, you know, is is essentially because VTrans um, is trying to be good, responsible fiscal stewards and saying that this is an expensive service hasn't worked out as quite as the way we hoped. So, you know, maybe we need to stop it. The other thing that's different about um, the MyRide service um, in Montpelier is that uh, where microtransit has um, really done well um, is with smaller areas moving a smaller amount of people. Um, my, the Montpelier My Ride is moving, I think, five times as many people as the next largest. And so, one of the things about microtransit is that um, it doesn't scale as economically efficiently as as fixed route does. Mm -hmm. And so, it really shines with low population densities. Um, but with higher population densities, it just, it's a very expensive form. And just so you know, I can talk all night about transit. This is, <laughs> you know, so, you know. Uh, well, I, I think, oddly, our kind of, our, our senior bus is a micro busing system in a way that I think is successful. I don't know how cost effective it is. I don't know what the numbers are. But I wonder in terms of the experiment and where we decide to launch things, did we look at different sizes of populations across the country and who's doing it, who's doing it right, who's doing it wrong. Um, is that something that we'll pursue at all in terms of um, some of the needs that are, aren't met in our state? Well, you know, I think that what we're learning is that there was a time period when it was like, microtransit's the future and everything will be microtransit. And now we're like, you know, it's a really good tool in these circumstances. And, um, and I do think that we will probably in the future, um, you know, see a, a microtransit up here, because one of the things that, um, um, as you just alluded to, the Essex Senior Van is kind of like microtransit, SSTA service is kind of like microtransit, and um, I could see a pathway where you would have SSTA or another provider like that uh, that potentially would be covering. Uh, you know, a regional area. Um, it's just hard to really think about that right now because of, you know, today the fight is retain and, and not expand. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Good. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Do something cheerful. <laughs> help inoculate yourself. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes.